Post-herpetic neuralgia is a terrible disease. Uh, as I mentioned, is comparable to other medical diseases, congestive heart failure, MI, MI, and so forth. And patients live with it for the rest of their life and are debilitated by it. So there have been many, many, many treatments that have been uh, used to try to ameliorate, ameliorate the pain. This is a table to show you all the different treatments that have been reported over the last hundred years uh, for um, uh, post-herpetic neuralgia. I don't think I have Dr. Portnoy likes to uh, describe uh, uh, a paper that was published back in the 1920s where they used pig stomach to, and they gave, had people uh, eat pig stomach in order to treat their post-herpetic neuralgia, and they claimed great success, but they never had any controlled studies. I don't know if that's listed here, but there have been many other studies, many other reports of things that have been used that really have not been studied adequately. But that's because people are desperate with this uh, disease. They're willing to do anything to try to get some relief. Yeah. It is mixed. It's mixed. You're right. It's neuropathic pain. There can be burning. There can be lancinating pain. All the things, all the qualities of neuropathic pain could be described by the patient. Uh, they can have throbbing, um, tightness, squeezing, pressure. Uh, sometimes. It depends on how much of the nerves are damaged. So if you have, um, you may have sensory loss, but have pain in the area. So if the virus has damaged the nervous system to the point that you have numbness, then they may say, I don't feel anything, but it hurts like hell. You know, they don't have any, I, I just, I don't feel anything. You test them with a pin, there's no response, but they say it hurts like hell there. So yes, it is a neuropathic pain. And it's a, I, I may be bringing it up a little later, but it's a, a great point that you raise because zoster has a central component because the viral replication spreads not only in the nerve distribution, that's why you see the vesicles. The vesicles contain virus. And that's another thing, uh, that if someone comes in with acute shingles and they have vesicles, they should not be in contact with pregnant women or other individuals who are immunocompressed, uh, immunocompromised because they have the potential for disseminating the virus to others. And, uh, and in pregnancy, uh, a zoster virus can cause significant fetal damage and a lot of birth defects, uh, mental retardation, heart defects, and, and so forth. So the virus spreads from the peripheral nerve out, and that's why you see the lesions, and those vesicles contain vi virus particles. Once the scabs form then there's, and, and the scabs fall off, the scabs will have virus particles. Once the scabs fall off and there's no more lesions, then they're not infective any longer. So then they can, uh, you know, you don't have to restrict them from con uh, contact with others. The virus also spreads into the central nervous system and causes cord damage. So you get central pain uh, developing, and that's probably why it makes it so hard to treat. You have peripheral nerve and central uh, nervous system damage causing the pain. Did I answer your question? Okay. So next, please. Okay. Um, this is kind of what you were talking about, direct viral damage, inflammatory neuritis of peripheral nerves, dorsal root ganglion, and the spinal cord. When the virus, when you, and it sets up an inflammatory response. And when you have an inflammatory response, the body heals with fibrosis. And the, the virus damages nerves. So you can get the paresis if it's in a motor area or... Uh, motor function or 
Uh, you might get um, numbness if it affects the uh, um, uh, afferent uh, sensory nerves. And so you get destruction of nerve tissue and it heals with scarring. Now, we know with low back pain and patients have surgery and herniated discs that you can get scarring and it's thought that that can cause pain, radicular symptoms. Well, it's no different with zoster. You get scarring in the area of, of the nervous tissue. It can compress and pull and um, uh, uh, affect the nervous system and, and contribute to the formation of pain. With damage to the nervous system, you get what's called the deafferentation syndrome and neuroplasticity. So now there's changes in the, in the nervous system. Deafferentation means that the uh, input from the periphery of the body to the central nervous system is cut off. So if the virus damages the nerves that come into the spinal cord, that's then you're deafferented. The afferent nerve impulses are gone. And then that can set you up for neuroplasticity or changes in the spinal cord. These changes in the spinal cord, they're not getting the information from the periphery to process and they read it as something abnormal. And so it can set up uh, a central pain syndrome. Okay. Um, and as you asked what they described, the descriptors are of a neuropathic nature, but they're complex. They can have many different qualitative descriptors for their pain. Next, please. Um, what do you do if someone... So we talked about a little bit of prevention. Prevention, um, uh, the uh, vaccine for sure. Uh, tricyclics, if they develop acute zoster certainly within 48 hours, antivirals within 72 hours. So what now, uh, what do you do now if someone comes in after they've had their outbreak, it's uh, a couple of weeks since the scabs fall off and they're in, in tremendous pain. These are agents that are reported to be effective in helping to reduce post-herpetic neuralgia. Topical agents like lidoderm patch has been studied and shown to help reduce it. We have Qtenza patches for, and that's been shown to reduce uh, the pain for about three months. Tricyclics are helpful in uh, addressing neuropathic pain. Anti-epileptic drugs, we can use, try opiates and continue them if they're effective. Now, anti-inflammatories. And this relates to interventional approaches. You can try anti-inflammatories like oral steroids. Because if you remember, there's a neuritis. There's an inflammatory process. So if there's an inflammatory process, you want to give it an anti-inflammatory. Prednisone is the best one to use for that in, in my experience. If you give prednisone a tapering course, a lot of patients can have their pain reduced and, and get some comfort, at least for a while. Along with the anti-inflammatories, interventional approaches, epidural steroids or intrathecal steroids have been reported in case series or in double-blind administrations to help reduce the severity of post-herpetic neuralgia. Um, other interventional approaches could be uh, neuraxial analgesia with things like opiates uh, and clonidine, perhaps baclofen. Um, spinal cord stimulator doesn't work for post-herpetic neuralgia. Well, if your spinal cord is damaged, you can't stimulate the dorsal uh, columns and the uh, large fibers. So, um, you know, it's, it doesn't seem to be very effective. So that's why you don't see a lot of patients having spinal cord stimulation. But uh, neuraxial approaches, I mean, you can trial those. And uh, if the patient responds, you can implant the device. Okay, next.